Hi, I'm Michelle Adabato. The North Ward Center is committed to educating the public about the importance of community programs that give all New Jersey residents a chance for a better life. That's why we're proud to support the important educational programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, founded by the Jewish community. RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Resources, Kessler Foundation, changing the lives of people with disabilities, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Fidelco Group, and by the Northward Center. Promotional support provided by the New Jersey Business and Industry Association and by Observer New Jersey Politics. Welcome to Caucus. I'm Steve Adubato. Joining me today in the studio to discuss mental health care for veterans, what we're doing right, and the ways we can improve. We are joined by Tim Aurora, Program Coordinator for Operation Veterans to Social Workers at Family Connections. Dr. Patricia Finley, Associate Professor in the School of Social Work at Rutgers University in New Brunswick. Michael Armstrong, CEO of Community Hope. And finally, Back again with us, Thank you. because you're that good, Dr. Steve Margiotis, Executive Director of Main Street Counseling. Thank you all for joining us. We're, Thank, you. Um, Thank you for having us. Thank it you. is great to have you, Michael, and everyone here. We're doing this series that really looks at veterans, the, service that the services that are out there, <clears throat> what veterans need, how to access those services. So you're going to see a website up, different websites up from different organizations, because we are attempting to be that conduit to get that important information out there. Steve, when we talk about mental health issues, or mental health for veterans. First, what kinds of issues are veterans facing, and are they different from the rest of us who are dealing with some issues? Actually, they're not. I think you're dealing with anxiety. I think you're dealing with depression. I think you're dealing with access to care. Um, and some of the frustrations in the past have evolved. How do I get access to care? Um, the veterans we're seeing at Main Street are coming in no different than other clients. Oh, let's describe your place. I want to make sure everybody knows. Main, Main Street, Street Counseling Center is a nonprofit mental health center that I started in 1980. We're going on four decades now. And our key mission, Steve, has always been access to mental health care. No catchment areas. We're open at night. Um, what does it mean, catchment areas? Um, we're not restricted just to West Orange. We're not restricted just to Essex County. If you can get to our place, We'll provide the services. By so way, we're Steve's, actually poor. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, Main Street's information will be up there as we talk about this. Michael, let me ask you, Community Hope does? Well, we provide housing and support services for veterans and their families. We have everything from our residential programs to uh, our SSVF program, which is designed to help veterans and their families either avoid homelessness or if they become homeless, get rapidly rehoused. Doctor, I'm going to get to you in a second, but Tim, I want to ask you. Sure. You served in Iraq. Yes, I did. During what period of time? 2006-2007, uh, during the government transition, or um, when I was there, they called it the murder intimidation campaign, mm. where I was specifically stationed. So break this down for us sure. from a very human, personal level. Um, and you're helping lots of veterans today. What kinds of issues are we talking about, and what was it like for you? For a personal transition for me? Yes. Um, well, the problem when I was transitioning back into civilian life was that there was a lack of services or a lack of feasibility in obtaining said services. The military trains you well to do the mission, but they don't train you well to readapt to civilian life. Is so, that part of the culture? Uh, it's part of the culture. Like it's on you to figure it out. Kind of, in a way. It's more peer-driven. So you pretty much learn how to navigate the system through your peers from veterans who've transitioned out of the military, but there's no... Um, transitional course in how to access different service points when you leave the military. So mm -hmm. a lot of what we do is helping... Yeah, by the way, put up stuff. your organization, Family Connections. Yes. If we could, Jackie, let's put up the website, because again, we're trying to provide uh, linkage, if you will, people can follow up. I'm sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. No, that's no problem. So part of what my program does is we assist in that transition period. A lot of times, veterans still hold on to that potential stigma of mental health. But we offer that relief of the stigma by being from peer perspective. All of our clinicians are veterans or currently serving, and they're currently affiliated with the university, whether it be Rutgers, Monmouth University, or Fordham University. But they have the veteran background. They have literally walked a mile in the client's shoes. Mm. The rapport that's established is almost immediate with the clients. 
And a lot of the issues that we've seen range from military sexual trauma, sexual trauma through the lifespan. Back, back, back up. Sure. Military sexual trauma. Yes. Talk about that. Um, well, unfortunately, it's a very prevalent issue. Um, both male and female clients in our facility have screened positive for it who served. Um, it's what can be known as the invisible wound of war. Oftentimes, the invisible wound of war. Right. Or service, for that matter. It doesn't have to happen in a combat zone. Um, and it goes unreported, unfortunately, quite a bit because of retaliation issues. So usually persons don't speak up about it when they're in service and have to wait many years until that pain has only deepened and worsened until they speak to someone about and it. And there are services. Put up yours information, but now we're going to talk to Dr. Finley. The Rutgers connection here, and let's stay on this issue. By the way, give me the expression again, sexual... Military sexual trauma, MST. Can you talk about MST? Because we're going to talk about PTSD in just in a second. Yeah, MST. I certainly did some work in the VA system as well, and we know it's a common problem there as well. And it's not well covered in the news because people don't speak about it. It's definitely the hidden, hidden disability, really. And you can get um, military benefits through the disability system for it, but it means you have to recount your experience. So you're re-traumatized when you're talking about your... Um, yes. Incident. Have you seen that with your yes. clients? Yes. So what advice would you give right now? You've got veterans out there, oh, gosh. people who have served, you have family members who love and care for them, you have friends, others who love and care for them. Tell them what they should do right now if they've experienced that. To reach out. Reach out to one of these agencies or to the Vet to Vet program, which is through um, University uh, Behavioral Health Center mm -hmm. through Rutgers University. Talk to another veteran. Talk to somebody. Don't talk to a, a church member, too. A lot of people will talk to their church members or their family members, but don't keep it in. Get it out. And, and, and Steve, I'm curious about this. And by the way, um, it is through the health of the Healthcare Foundation in New Jersey that we're able to do this. And they understand and appreciate and support many of the organizations as, as well as us in this. And one of the other programs in this series we're going to be doing is looking at female veterans and the issues they face that are somewhat unique to being a woman in the military, but this is a whole series. But Steve, I'm going to go back to this. For veterans right now looking, or family members who say, you know what, okay, I see the information up there, that's great, we'll tough it out ourselves, you say? There's no shoulds in life. You feel what you feel, okay? Whether we're talking about trauma, we're talking about sexual assault, we're talking about depression, there's no one way to react to a situation. And right now, to legitimize the issue, you have to talk about it. Talking helps. The more you talk, the less you're going to act out physically. Go back to the stigma issue, which you and I have talked about for over a decade. Michael, is it somehow different or more challenging for people coming back from serving our country, the mental health stigma? Uh, well, I think the mental health stigma in general is, a, is problematic. And I think particularly in a military setting where is a, you know, uh, you know, uh, emphasis put on being brave and being courageous and, uh, you know, uh, tough, move, it out. tough it out, you know, I think it's even exacerbated. I mean, it's much worse. I think that uh, it's an ongoing problem. Well, we'll stay with this. The, the aggression issue or the aggressive issue, and I'm not going to stereotype. I'm going to try not to. <clears throat> when I was, when we were getting ready for the show, we were talking to our producers about the issue of domestic violence. Mm -hmm. What correlation do we know exists, or what do we think is the case when it comes to domestic violence issues having to do with vets as a mental health issue? What do, we do? do you see it as well? We've seen domestic violence yeah. issues so. at uh, Family Connections in regards to veterans and how they work with their spouses or within the family unit, even my past work and working with vets too. Um, but oftentimes, you know, they're there's a huge uh, discourse in the communication process. What do you mean? It's a lack of understanding from the other partner. A disconnect, you mean? A huge disconnect between the two partners, but that doesn't... So he comes home or she comes home from serving? Right, but just to clarify, that doesn't okay any of the situations at all. But what it is, is there's, you can kind of amount it to a buildup of emotions on both ends, and there's a cataclysmic you know, occurrence between the two parties, but without proper um, resources available which unfortunately doesn't happen from the transition from combat to civilian life, that these events are going to happen, unfortunately, fairly often. So, so, so once again, I'm going to do this as we talk about this. There are people watching right now, in New Jersey primarily, but other states around, who are experiencing this, who may be victims of it, who may, in fact, be perpetrating the kind of domestic violence we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Steve and Doctor, both doctors. Mm -hmm. What should they do right now? No matter where you are in this, um, you have to reach out for help. Yeah. You have to normalize the situation. Devil's advocate, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. Someone says, 
Come on. I'm going to bring my stuff. I'm going to put my stuff out there. I, I can't figure out what's going on with me. Listen, I've never served, so I have no idea. I uh, only have friends and others who describe it, and we've done many programs, but again, I can't personally relate to it. You want me to bring it out there? You want to expose, you want me to expose myself? And I say yes because the way you're dealing with it now is not working. Right. This doesn't work, okay? There's cause and strain. And there's a victim or multiple victims multiple. involved. Right, because right. there's children that are witnessing this right. abuse. No so violence. if you can't do it for yourself, do it for your children. And sometimes that, that hook will bring mm -hmm. them in to talk. So the incentive yeah. piece, let's talk about the motivation and incentive piece as we continue to put up information. We can't, we can bring you to the, we can't make you drink. We can't make you, you know, mm -hmm. we can bring you to the well, if you will. Go ahead. Well, you actually brought up a point of like what happens with this, how do you convince a vet? And personally, being a Marine, one of the biggest things that we do in the Marine Corps is weapons maintenance. Weapons and, maintenance. Right, so in regards to when you transition out, your mind is the ultimate weapon. It's your greatest adversary or greatest ally. So, and with us, you have to be on top of maintaining your primary weapon, which in the Marine Corps is your rifle. So I like analogies, because I think they work sure. well, or metaphors. But if you don't take care of your weapon, if you don't clean it, condition it, take that effort into making it up to standard, taking it effective into what you need to get, to get the mission done, then it will not work for you. If you don't take care of your mind, which is your greatest weapon, and clean it, maintain it, get it the help that it needs if it is in ways broken or unmanageable, unserviced, then it's going to work let, against you. Let me you. challenge the analogy. Okay. Sure. Um, in an effort to help people better understand this. When your weapon is not working, it is mm -hmm. crystal clear that your weapon is not working. Right. If one's mind is not healthy and where it needs to be when he or she um, comes home, right? One doesn't know what one doesn't know. One may not want to acknowledge that that <coughs> weapon is not working. Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> isn't it more complicated? Respectfully, I appreciate the analogy, but it seems much more complicated. Well, it is. And then I'll have you jump back in. Sure. Go ahead. No, no, I think it is, and I think one of the times when leverage is important is to educate, leverage, uh, leverage uh, you know, to uh, help people get into treatment. I mean, to educate the people that they're likely to come in contact with, you know, the clergy, the police department, uh, you know, other uh, ways that, uh, you, know, the, uh, you know, even social service entities, you know, because often they're going to be economic uh, social issues, there's going to be domestic violence, as we've talked about, and to use uh, some of those resources. Sometimes that's uh, some very helpful leverage to get people, because as you say, people, when they're in the state, don't realize it. They often need a push. They often mm. need some uh, a little arm twist uh, as well as love, and um, I think this is one way of get, educating the people that the, they and their families are likely to come into. We're going to a quick break right here. When we come back, we'll pick up this conversation, but I also want to talk about housing and homelessness. Right? I want to talk about vets in college and a whole range of other issues as we talk about the challenges that our veterans are, in fact, facing. This particular program deals with mental health issues, but it's part of a larger series we're doing. We'll be right back right after this. To see more Caucus New Jersey with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Steve Adubato, PhD. And follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. We're back, folks. We're continuing. The conversation keeps going even when we're off yeah. the air. Um, I'm going to give you a chance, Tim. Sure. And we're going to move back. We're going to go on to housing and education in a second. Close the loop on this weapons analogy. Sure. Well, the biggest thing is you're taught in the military that you only have one resource. You only have one way to go if you want help in this issue that you brought up of domestic violence related to the aggression issue. You're only taught that the only place to go is medic or go on base for counseling or go to the chapel. What about when you're out? What about when you return exactly. home? Exactly. But as we talked about uh, a while ago over the summer during the veterans panel is options. And I want the veterans and their families to know out there that there are options to addressing these needs. If there is a veteran who has these feelings of aggression, like, wow, I may potentially hurt my spouse. I may potentially hurt my children. They don't have to just think, I only have to go to the VA. I only have to talk to my chaplain. More options. Right, but exactly. Knowing them, knowing them is key. Knowing them is half the battle. The Going other to half? them and using them is the other half of the battle. Having the courage to speak up. Oftentimes, you don't want to look like the guy that's like, hey, I or don't have the courage. Or woman, exactly. Apologies for that. Um, to say, hey, I don't want to talk this. 
it takes a lot of strength and courage okay. to speak up and admit that you want help or need help or the family mm -hmm. needs to maybe have a dialogue opened up because for some reason there is lack of ability to open up such sure. a And by the way, as Dr. Marjorie said, what is happening right now is not working in certain cases. Exactly. Can yeah. we the, home, the homelessness issue? Uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, yeah. right? You don't get the self-awareness or self-actualization until you have a roof over your head and yep. something to eat and feel safe. Let's talk about this housing issue. What are we dealing with? Well, I think we've, we've come a long way. We've made some strides. Uh, we've developed housing. And we recently got a grant, uh, or we got tax credit, so we can build another 50 units of uh, Describe housing. Describe the organization again in this we, regard. We, we, do, we uh, Community Hope, and we have a continuum of housing uh, for um, the veterans, and it's everything from transitional housing to permanent housing to the programs designed to help individuals avoid and Transitional homes. housing means? Well, they can stay there for up to two years. Usually uh, most individuals don't stay there that long and our goal there is to get them stabilized, to get them back in, to get them into permanent housing and uh, move them on. How do they find you, Michael? I'm sorry? How do they find you as we put up your website? We have a, we, there's a number that we have. If they call that number, we can then sort them out. If the they go on that site, sorry again for interrupting me. If they go on that site, will they be able to, the Community yeah. Hope site is up right now. Yeah, they, the, the Community Hope site, and then there's also the number uh, that uh, I think we should have. Uh, that uh, If you call that number, we'll be able to help you figure out whether you need permanent is that housing. On that site? Yes, uh-huh. Okay. Temporary housing or what kind of assistance you need. Is, yeah. this a, is housing and homelessness... It's an economic issue. Is it a mental yeah. health? It is absolutely a mental health issue. How so, doctor? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people because because of their whatever their experience, they might have a mental health issue that means they can't get a job, means they can't earn money to get housing. They can't. Their, their lives are chaotic. They can't keep going forward, so they really can't get that stable housing. They can't develop relationships to be with other people. So I'm not sure if you guys will have no it, exactly um, relationships with other people yeah. include bosses. Mm -hmm. So job turnover, not only spouses and, and children, but we see a lot of vets, too, um, who aren't working or are underemployed. Um, and, and a big issue is dealing with authority and dealing with the conflict of bosses. Um, so first things first, um, can the sessions go well? Okay. What do you mean, can the sessions Well, go? if you're going to fight your therapist, um, oh, wow. there's I didn't a, even think of that. Then there's a bigger chance you're going to fight your boss. Um, so I say that sincerely. To your family. Yes. Can the sessions go well? Will you come on time? Will you pay the fee? Will you not be argumentative? You'd be surprised how many have a difficult time in the treatment process, which carries over into the into the other areas. So let's do this as we're talking about it. the education piece. Uh, by the way, accessing education, and then the challenges of of actually integrating into yes, the ahead, college university setting, absolutely. There is a GI Bill there, and it's, it's very regulated, and as you're, I don't know when you're released to come out into the real world, um, mm -hmm. they talked about, about your benefits that you had available to you, but... You mean the outside military world? Yeah, when you're, you're finally able to go to university. Mm -hmm. Now, Rutgers has something called the Veterans House. I understand we're the second leading program in the nation now, military what, what your times. your services describe them? We provide, we call it one-stop shopping. Um, Military culture is so important that we understand that as therapists, but as, as well as service providers, that there is a culture that these guys and gals are coming, coming from and coming into our university setting. Very different than the culture that these young undergrads or graduate students sure. have experienced. What are the biggest differences? Um, much more rigorous training. They really are, they want to get the job done. They get in there. They, they go to classes. They show up on time. So where's the devil's advocate? What's the problem? The other students aren't like that. That tolerance of mm -hmm. partying over the weekends, the late mm -hmm. nights in the dorms. So a lot of our students, even though they're undergraduates, are housed in graduate housing where it's mm -hmm. quieter, where it's a much calmer envi environment. But also this one-stop shopping. Um, we deal with the registration, uh, tuition, billing, counseling, tutoring, all in a single building. But on the mental health piece, say a student, a veteran, mm -hmm. coming back, be he or she at Rutgers or some of the other schools that are involved, feels very isolated because of what you described. These other students are different. Absolutely. They are different. They feel isolated. You have to, again, acknowledging that I feel isolated. That's right. And it doesn't feel good. Mm -hmm. That's, if you recognize that, there's a big push on most campuses to find veterans. Is there? Absolutely. Find Across them the and nation, do what? To bring them in, to identify them as veterans, see if they need additional services. We know that there's more and more students coming back into the university and college settings that are 
better understand. You know, I don't get it's um, mm, a call our producer in our ear it is it knows I'm gonna where I'm going. I think she knows where I'm going. I happen to be teaching at a particular university <clears throat> at night right now, and there was one of the students, I won't say his name, but he was having a difficult time at the beginning of the semester. And I was like, and I, my first reaction as the professor in the course was like, look, he missed X number of classes, he's out. He comes to the next class, and I said, just tell us what the story was. And he started saying, I just got back from the military. I'm trying, and he started to describe it, and I thought, I shouldn't have never, the point I'm making is I never should have had him talk about it publicly in front of anyone. But as he was talking about it, I thought, oh my God, we have no idea. And so I said, listen, we're good, we can catch up. The point I'm trying to make is, it's not about setting a different set of rules for those who come back, but it's trying to empathize. Am I getting this wrong? Yes. That's exactly. That's you have word. to validate the experience. And I think whatever the problem area is, we were talking about before, we're drug and alcohol. You have to validate the experience. Validate the experience. Translate that. Translate in, in, in terms of what's it like now to sit in a structured classroom. What's it like to sit with kids five years younger? They're all younger. Yes, mm -hmm. who are into partying, and, and I'm trying to come back from a situation which, for a lot of you guys in class, would be surreal. And by so, the way, he's quote he was about to get married. I think. <laughs> that's which stress. Stress. Oh, that's, that's right? a, that's, yeah. oh, that's just a great thing. Well, it may not have been. As easy, right? Sure, right. because now we're talking about intimacy. Okay, we're talking about getting close to somebody. These are emotional, mental health, behavioral health issues. Yes, and maybe I'm not ready to get close to somebody dropping because the of whether through yeah, dropping the guard. Dropping the guard. What does that mean, dropping the guard? Well, it's it's dropping that protective persona that you have. You, oftentimes, for service members, we have to have that that courageous facade. I'd like to call it. Um, where you have this protective veil over yourself from allowing people to get too close. From so being vulnerable, vulnerable equals right. what? Well, being vulnerable is you put yourself at risk as a veteran. You put yourself at risk for potentially being taken advantage of. You put yourself at risk for feeling that fear of vulnerability. But in civilian life, being vulnerable. The training is different. quite embedded, and it's hard to break down those walls. Jump yeah. back in, Michael. Yeah, I mean, I think this is, one of, left. This is one of the gaps that we, Tim was talking about mm -hmm. before. We prepare, you know, the people who serve very well, but we don't decompress them Just when they get ready decompress to. Decompress them. You know, they've been trained. They're on a ready state. We don't do anything to help them bridge the gap. The Department of Defense and the Department of Veterans Affairs are two of the largest bureaucracies in the world, and they, until recently, rarely talk with one another. And to talk about some sort of period when we can help... Uh, veterans uh, kind of a reverse basic training mm -hmm. to move from uh, military Absolutely. life to civilian life they so they can prepare, get prepared for it. Reverse but, basic training. We had to get first basic training, get ready to be in, and, which and then they get did ready to II. get out to get to the Hold on a second, they did in World War II. They would not have you come home immediately. Although it was a different scenario, but there were duty stations within Europe. You were not coming back from Europe immediately to the States. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So you would be decompressing, so to speak, in France, in Italy. Did, did, so did we... a lot of these behaviors, these aggressive behaviors, these substance abuse related behaviors would be mm -hmm. in a way kind of worked out elsewhere and it allows that decompression okay. time from those events to occur. But right now mm -hmm. there are more services than ever before. They may not always be provided by the government, some of them provided mm -hmm. by the government. But there are not-for-profit organizations. There are institutions right. of higher learning. Yeah. That's right. And so, Steve, uh, one more time. To every veteran, male Anyone? or female, Go ahead. family member, mm -hmm. friend, someone who cares about someone, right. tell them again, as we put up Main Street site and we put up everyone else's, someone says, uh, I'm not ready to let, quote, my guard down. I think that's the challenge, in that you have to let your guard down. And I think they've been tricked you. because in service, don't let your guard down. Now you're coming out of service and you're asking me to let my guard down, to share, to verbalize, to be close to people. That's incredibly difficult to do and you can't see it. It's an emotional issue. So it's very difficult. So, someone might say watching the show, show, oh Steve, you're overcomplicating. Your, your, your panel's overcomplicating the issue. You're smiling? It's mental health. It's always overcomplicated. Yeah. <laughs> so it just is. It always is overcomplicated. Right. It, 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 yeah. But if we don't talk about it, and listen, you can, choose, you can talk about it. You don't have to talk about it. Um, some of us who've been to counseling talk about it. Some choose not to. That's your right. But I just, my sense is as we're doing more of these programs and we'll continue to do them, mm -hmm. that the stakes seem even higher sometimes oh, yes. for veterans because of the potential consequences. Yeah, look at the Vietnam era. 
Yeah. Yeah, they came back without the services. Right. We were supposed to learn from our history, and we're not. And we lost so many of the, not just lost them in war, but lost them when they were back. Michael, final oh, yeah. 30 seconds, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, it's just, I think that's one of the good, you know, the things that we're doing right is talking about it. You know, having dialogues like this, having the public discuss veterans. I'm a Vietnam era veteran, and at that point, people weren't able to distinguish between, you know, the soldier and the person who served mm -hmm. and the war. Now we've got a dialogue where people can appreciate the sacrifice okay. that veterans have made, and they right. can still disagree with I, the war. I, I'm sorry, Michael, I promise we'll continue the conversation, particularly with leaders like you, will help make a difference. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The preceding program has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of Caucus New Jersey has been provided by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey, RWJ Barnabas Health, New Jersey Resources, Kessler Foundation, MD Advantage Insurance Company of New Jersey, the Fidelco Group, and by the Northward Center. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Caucus New Jersey has been produced in partnership with TriStar Studios. Hi, I'm Eric. You might see me as an ordinary person, but I've been living with a brain injury for nearly two years. One of my struggles is short-term memory loss. At Opportunity Project, I'm given hope and support, and I've gained my comments back through the job placement program. Despite my challenges, I have a reason to keep improving. Today, even though life has changed me, I believe that anything is possible. If you have a brain injury, you don't have to face your road to recovery alone.